Hi everyone, welcome back to another lesson. We're talking about Seminella food poisoning in this lesson, which causes the condition known as Seminellosis. So we're going to discuss how we can get infected by this particular bacteria, what happens in the gastrointestinal system to cause signs and symptoms. We'll also talk about those signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed and how it's treated. So Seminellosis, again, is a bacterial infection of the gastrointestinal system caused by Seminella species. Now, Seminella is a particular type of bacteria. It is gram-negative, so when we stain the bacteria, it comes up as a pinkish color. It's flagellated, so it has this little tail that it can use to move, so it's motile. It's also hydrogen sulfide producing. This is going to be in contrast to bacteria like Shigella, which is a bacteria that doesn't produce hydrogen sulfide. It's acid labile, which is going to be important when we talk about how we get infected with it. And it's facultatively intracellular. So it is possible for it to live inside of cells during certain situations. Now, there are different species of Seminella bacteria. We separate them into typhoidal Seminella and non-typhoidal Seminella. So typhoidal Seminella, like Seminella typhi and paratyphi, these are going to lead to typhoid fever. And then the non-typhoidal are going to lead to what we're going to talk about in this lesson. So these include Seminella enteritidis, Seminella typhimurium, and Newport. So these particular species are going to be what we call non-typhoidal. They can lead to gastroenteritis or an infection and inflammation of the gastrointestinal system. So we're going to be discussing these particular bacteria in this lesson. If you want more information on typhoid fever, please check out my lesson on that topic. Seminella is actually one of the most common causes of food poisoning. And in the United States, for instance, because it's a reportable infection, at least 1 million cases are reported in the United States per year. So it's a relatively common condition. So how do individuals become infected with this particular bacteria? Most of the time we're going to see it in places like consumption of raw or undercooked chicken. That's going to be a very common cause here. But we can also see it in other raw or undercooked products like eggs, meat, and dairy products as well. So all of those particular food items may have salmonella. If they're not cooked well enough to destroy the bacteria, individuals who consume them can become infected with that particular bacteria. And then another way that individuals can be exposed to this particular bacteria is exposure to reptiles. So a lot of times if we see cases of children going to petting zoos, for instance, and if they touch reptiles and then they end up touching their mouth, they can expose themselves to Seminella. That is also another way that they can get infected. And with regards to non-typhoidal Seminella, we require a large inoculum. So inoculum simply means a large dose of the bacteria for infection to occur. The reason is because of what we mentioned in the last slide, that Seminella is acid labile. Acid labile means that it is prone to being destroyed by acid. So it is sensitive to acid. So you need a larger amount of exposure, a larger consumption or a larger amount of consumed bacteria to survive the acid in your stomach. And then at least some can get through that acidic stomach into the small intestine to cause infection. And because of this, we often need a large number of bacteria. So 10 to the 6, so 1 million bacteria are needed to be ingested at one time to cause infection. But important points to make note of here is that in low gastric acidity states, and what I mean by that is we can see lower gastric acidity in patients who are taking antacid. If you take antacids regularly, your stomach acidity can be not as strong. So you can be more prone to getting infected with a lower dose of bacteria. Also in proton pump inhibitor users, so PPIs like pantoprazole, and also in older patients as well, because as we get older, our stomach acid levels also decline as well. So in those particular cases where we have lower gastric acidity, we may only need 10 to the 3 bacteria, which is only a 1,000 bacteria needed to cause infection in those particular patients. And what we also can find is that with the larger inoculum, so the more bacteria you are consuming, the shorter the incubation period, the incubation period is when you first ingest bacteria and when you have onset of symptoms, there's a shorter incubation period with a larger amount of bacteria consumed at one time, and then also increased severity of illness. So this all makes sense. The more bacteria you're introducing into the system, you're going to have shorter incubation period and more severe illness. This can also apply to patients with lower gastric acidity. So in those patients, because they need less dosing of bacteria to cause infection, they can have shorter incubation periods and increased severity of illness. So again, we get this bacteria either from 
raw or undercooked food, that's going to be the most common way we get this bacteria. It gets introduced into our gastrointestinal system, passes through the stomach. Again, it's acid label, so a lot of it gets destroyed, but if there's enough of it, some of it can survive to get into the small intestine. So again, some of it, a minority of it will survive the stomach acid. Then that small amount will pass into the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine, and then it will start to multiply within the small intestine. Now, when it's in the small intestine, it's going to use what we call fimbriae or pili to attach to small intestine cells. So it has these little projections off of its cell body. It can use those to attach to the cells inside your small intestine. And then what it's going to do is it's going to then interact with and utilize what we call M cells to enter into the intestinal mucosa. So it can literally start to penetrate into the gastrointestinal mucosa. It gets into what we call payer patches. The M cells are part of the payer patches. They're part of the, our immune system inside the intestine. And then what happens is the salmonella bacteria gets taken up by these cells. They're delivered in what we call phagosome. So these cells eat up the bacteria. They keep the bacteria localized in, in a vesicle inside the cell, what we call phagosomes. Then these bacteria can survive and get released into another part of the small intestinal layer called the lamina propria. So they cross through the epithelium, enter into the lamina propria, they're released there, and then they end up causing immune cell responses. So we start to get an influx of neutrophils. So this particular cell type. So this is how they end up penetrating into the intestinal mucosa, entering into a layer called the lamina propria, leading to an influx of neutrophils. These are white blood cells that often deal with bacteria. So all of this is going to lead to inflammation in the gastrointestinal system and cause symptoms. Now the average incubation period, so the period from which we ingest those bacteria when we get exposed to them, and then the symptom onset, that period of time is anywhere from 6 hours to 72 hours. So again, we talked about larger inoculums or lower gastric acidity levels, we can have a shorter incubation period. Or if it's vice versa, lower inoculum levels, higher gastric acidity, the incubation period might be longer. Now moving on to some of the main hallmark findings of non-typhoidal seminella infections, it leads us to what we call non-typhoidal enterocolitis. Enterocolitis refers to inflammation, itis refers to inflammation, enterocol refers to the small intestine and the large intestine, so it's inflammation of the small and large intestine, and we may also refer to this as seminella gastroenteritis or NTS, non-typhoidal seminella gastroenteritis, and what we're going to see is we're going to get acute diarrhea, so we call it acute diarrhea because it is diarrhea that occurs less than two weeks, so it doesn't last longer than two weeks, that is going to be caused by infectious causes. And then chronic diarrhea is going to be anywhere from more than two to four weeks. And that's often going to be related to a chronic medical condition like irritable bowel syndrome or inflammatory bowel disease. So it's acute diarrhea. It's going to be a diarrhea that lasts for two weeks or less. Most often, it can be longer in some cases. It's going to be a watery diarrhea. That's going to be important here. It's a watery diarrhea as opposed to some other types of diarrhea we can get from other infections like Campylobacter jejuni infections or Shigella infections. These can cause bloody diarrhea. But importantly enough, we can see in some cases of non-typhoidal seminella infections, we can see bloody diarrhea in certain types. And that's often going to be from infections with seminella typhimurium, for instance. But again, it's more common that it's going to be watery diarrhea. We can also see abdominal pain as well. It's often going to be a sudden onset of abdominal pain and it would be cramping. So we're going to get abdominal pain, sudden onset with acute diarrhea, often watery. We can also see a fever as well. So this can also be something that can be noted. We can also see a headache, myalgias or muscle aches and pains. We can also see tenesmus in some more severe cases. So tenesmus is a feeling that you need to use the washroom, you need to have a bowel movement, but you don't actually. So it's just a feeling that you have to. Again, it's uncommon. We can also see dehydration in some cases, although this may be a bit more uncommon, but it can happen, especially if you have a lot of watery diarrhea. And then we may also see osteomyelitis in certain patient populations. So osteomyelitis is infection of a bone, and this is going to occur in sickle cell disease patients. Now, if you wonder why this might happen. Sickle cell disease patients, because of acute crises that occur due to cell cycling, they can have asplenia, which is reduced or absent 
splenic functioning. The spleen is very important in dealing with seminella infections. And also sickle cell disease patients can have bone infarcts because of those sickling crises as well. So because they get damaged to certain bones, that damage leads to structural abnormalities. So if a sickle cell disease patient gets a gastrointestinal infection with salmonella and that bacteria gets into the bloodstream, it's more likely to be able to survive because they have lower splenic functioning and also it's more likely to seed into a previously damaged bone or previously infarcted bone. So this is the reason why we can see salmonella as a cause of osteomyelitis in sickle cell disease patients because this is going to be something that doesn't occur in other patient populations where the most common cause of osteomyelitis in non-sickle cell disease patients is staphylococcus aureus for instance. So that leads us into the next topic where we have to make note of the fact that there is a certain percentage of non-typhoidal salmonella enterocolitis patients who will get bacteremia. Bacteremia is where the bacteria enters into the blood. So most of the time it's going to stay in the gastrointestinal system, but there's going to be about 5% of these patients that are going to get this particular bacteria in the blood. It crosses the intestinal layers, enters into the blood, and then it can lead to other issues. We mentioned one of those that was osteomyelitis. It can practically enter into any part of the body where we would call it then an extra intestinal focal infection. And about 40%, 40% of the patients who get bacteremia are going to have extra intestinal focal infection. So again, 5% of patients who get seminal food poisoning can get bacteria in their blood. And then 40% of those patients can have extra intestinal focal infections. Again, one of those is osteomyelitis, but we can see it in other parts of the body depending on if there's been any structural abnormalities. Generally, these bacteria like to seed into areas where there's been previous structural abnormalities. Now, there are particular severe complications that can occur in some patients, especially the ones that get the bacteremia. So we can often see signs and symptoms being worse in very young children, less than three months of age, and in the immunocompromised. Some particular conditions that can occur in some patients include meningitis or inflammation of the meninges, and also infective aortitis. Aortitis is an inflammation of the aorta. So some patients, again, those that are perhaps very, very young, immunocompromised, or sickle cell disease patients, they're more likely to have these particular severe complications. So those are going to be particular severe complications. These are going to be more rare, again, in certain patient populations. But on average, in relatively healthy patients, the signs and symptoms will be self-limited. So fever will resolve within 48 hours if there is a fever, and the diarrhea will resolve within three to seven days on average. So now let's discuss how seminolosis or non-typhoidal seminal infections are diagnosed by clinicians. So there may be many cases where this is diagnosed clinically, so maybe diagnosed simply as gastroenteritis or bacterial gastroenteritis. In other cases, stool culture can be performed, so getting a culture of the stool and then doing an analysis on that to see, oh, this is seminella causing this infection. Blood cultures can also be performed in certain patient populations, especially if it's there's worry of it's invasive, perhaps a patient has sickle cell disease, for instance, or they're young or immunocompromised, or if the infection is severe or persistent, then blood cultures can be performed. After doing these cultures, culture and sensitivity are going to be important to check to see how sensitive these particular bacteria are to certain antibiotics. In the case where we may have a sickle cell disease patient, a radiograph or an x-ray of the bone in question can be helpful to check for osteomyelitis, although if it's acute osteomyelitis, we're not going to see x-ray findings. It's often going to be chronic cases or chronic osteomyelitis where we're going to see radiographic findings. In the case where we have salmonella meningitis, CSF analysis is going to be important, so cerebral spinal fluid analysis. So we'd have high opening pressure, we'd have high protein, low glucose, some findings of bacterial meningitis, for instance. And if you were to do other blood work, white blood cell count can often be normal in non-typhoidal seminella infections. ESR, or erythrocyte sedimentation rate, is often normal as well. If it's high, we may want to think about a possible osteomyelitis in patients where we're suspecting it. And some patients can have a mild elevation in AST and ALT levels, so there may be a bit of mild inflammation of the liver. Now, how do clinicians treat seminolosis? So as I mentioned before, it's a self-limiting infection in 48 hours. The fever is often resolved. After three to seven days, the diarrhea can be resolved. So a lot of times, because it's self-limiting, especially in healthy patients, where we're not worried about other complications, it's going to be supportive management, hydration, making sure they get enough electrolytes. 
We can do oral hydration most of the time because they're not going to often be nauseous, but if in some cases where it's quite severe or they have nausea, then we can give them IV hydration. Antibiotic therapy can also be important for certain patient populations, and I put this heading here first because we don't want to give antibiotic therapy in healthy patients where we have no reason to suspect that there's any bacteremia or any complication from the infection because antibiotics may prolong fecal carriage in uncomplicated cases. So in the case where they have an uncomplicated case of gastroenteritis due to salmonella infection, if we give them antibiotics, they can actually harbor this bacteria for longer. So it oftentimes will extend or prolong the amount of time where patients have this bacteria in their system. Now, when do we want to give antibiotics? We want to give it to infants less than three months of age. That's going to be very important. In immunocompromised patients, in patients who have sickle cell disease, and in elderly patients, those are all going to be important as well. Now, with regards to the particular antibiotics that are used, we're often going to start off with a third generation cephalosporin, so ceftriaxone, for at least 7 to 10, and some sources say 7 to 14 days. So we start often broad, and then once we get the culture and sensitivities back, we may narrow down to a fluoroquinolone like ciprofloxacin, for instance. And then the duration of antibiotic is going to be longer in particular complications. So in meningitis, we can see the length of antibiotic use being four weeks or longer, and in osteomyelitis, four to six weeks. And then also important to point out here as well is that we don't want to use anti-motility medications like lopiramide to treat diarrheal symptoms because it often also prolongs fecal carriage as well. So it often is going to prolong infection, prolong carriage of this particular bacteria. And this is the same in the case of other bacterial diarrheal conditions like shigellosis, for instance. Please check my other lessons on shigellosis and Campylobacter jejuni if you want more information on other bacterial causes of gastroenteritis. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Please also consider joining as a member to access members-only content. It is a great help to support the channel. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.